The Westville Courthouse is the oldest Georgia courthouse built for Chattahoochee County, which was newly formed. It's the only such wood frame courthouse not significantly changed. It served the county for over a century before being replaced, saved by being moved to Westville in 1975. On the walls hang pictures of Westville structures yet to be moved to the current site. The rooms are furnished and decorated in period fashion. I don't know if this is how it looked in Lumpkin. Lots of information on the structures accompany the pictures. There doesn't seem to be a lot of description as to why the courthouse rooms are decorated this way. It looks like a house. Pretty rough. Oh yeah. Some of these floorboards like right here. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty, but I'll be glad when more buildings can be brought. is quiet. The location is good since it's in the city. I was afraid of noise. Across the street is the doctor's office. but the doctor is away at present. I can still shoot through the door.
sitting on the steps. It's very peaceful. Westville's fun. Between the mask, the hat, and the Bluetooth and the glasses, I look ridiculous. There's what appears to be an old gas station. 1880s? But no, it's a blacksmith shop. Looks like the blacksmith is away too. Probably out drinking and gambling with the doctor. Hmm. Oh well. Let's see what this building is. How are you doing? So this is a cool building. It is. I'm a pretty big fan of it. Cool in the summer, cool in the winter. Whether or not I want it to be, I feel like <laughs> I live in a wind tunnel. <laughs> oh. Get this wonderful cross breeze right through here. <laughs> Good sometimes. <laughs> it is. Uh, it'll be great in about two months. <laughs> right, right, yes. Yeah. So welcome to Adams. This is our clothing shop. My name is Olivia. I make most of the cl uh, clothing items that you see here on site. Cool. Um, so, are you from the southeast? I am actually from Columbus. Okay, perfect. You're going to be very <laughs> familiar with my plants in the corner here. Oh, yes. uh, so, we're actually going to run through the entire textile production, starting, cool. of course, with cotton. Now, most of our clothes in the 1800s were made of cotton, and that's still pretty true today. T-shirts, jeans, hoodies, masks, gloves, hats, cotton. Right. Um, now, if you are working with cotton, you've got a couple extra steps you need to do. First, of course, you'll have to gin it, which means to pull out the seeds. Now these were machine ginned. These here I did by hand. As you can see, the machine is far more efficient than a person. Oh, I see. Pretty big improvement there. Wow. Now after that, you are going to need to card your cotton. And the reason we card the cotton is to line up all the fibers. Because the longer the fibers are, when you start to spin, the stronger your thread's going to be. Interesting. So I'm just going to take these carding paddles here and pull them in opposite directions and start to line up those fibers. So ideally this is what you're trying to work with. Wow. Gonna get nice and long like this. Yeah. And then I'm just gonna roll that back onto itself. Basically, I'm trying to make a giant cotton ball. Right. All right, so this is your goal. <laughs> now, if you are a quilter, you can stop here. This is your batting. This is what you use oh, to line your quilts with. Okay. But if you're a spinster, the work has only just begun. All right. So that is what you're going to take and spin into your thread. Now, today wow. I happen to be working with wool, um, but all spinning pretty much works the same way, whether you're working with cotton to make thread, wool to make yarn, or even a large rope like this. So I'm just going to take my drop spindle here, and okay. exactly as the name implies, I'm going to drop it. I'm using that weight to hold tension on my fibers here. Gotcha. From that point, all I have to do is spin. Now that is the basic mechanic. This is not the best way to spin. You can look up close and see there's quite a few lumps and bumps, thick spots, thin spots, curly spots, loose spots, and there's two reasons for that. Number one, I'm not a professional spinster. <laughs> Number two, this is not the best way to spin. Gotcha. When you're only working in a three inch span like that, it's really easy for your size to drift up and down. Gotcha. Now, if you work with something like this over here, you're going to get a much more consistent result. That that's is our, the one I'm familiar with. <laughs> yeah, that's our walking wheel. So that's our largest non-industrial spinning wheel that we yeah. have here on the site. Biggest thing somebody might have had in their home. Hmm. Now with that one, the way it would work is there'd be a large loop of thread going around that wheel. It would connect on the left to the spindle, which is the metal piece pointing towards me. Yeah. So when you spin that big wheel kind of slow, that little spindle goes really fast, just like a dry belt. Now as long as you keep that wheel at the same speed, you're going to have a much more consistent result on your thread. So 
way better way to do things. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we have another spinning wheel right next to that on the floor. Now that is our parlor wheel. Parlor wheels are kind of weird because, well, they go in your parlor. Now if you have a parlor in the 1800s, you are reasonably wealthy. If you are reasonably wealthy, you do not need to spin your own thread. <laughs> so my understanding is that these are more of a novelty piece mm. as opposed to an actual useful tool. I gotcha. Uh, did women spin with them as they sat in their parlors? Sure, maybe. Mm. Were they producing enough thread to actually get anything done? Probably nah. not. Hobby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more of a hobby. Yeah. Uh, now right next to that, we also have our warping board. Now what we're doing here is just stretching out our thread. I told you with that walking wheel, you get a much more consistent result in your thread. Yeah. And that is true, but it's hardly perfect. It's still got some tight spots and some loose spots. So right there, we're just giving it a nice stretch to even out that tension and make it a lot less likely to tangle. Right, gotcha. Now right next to that, we also have our weasel, that little hexagon down there. Oh, yeah. If you've ever heard a children's song, Pop Goes the Weasel, uh, this is actually where it comes from. So the weasel is for measuring your thread. You would sit right there next to it, take one of those cones of thread like we have on the floor that have just been spun, mm -hmm. and wrap that around the wheel. Gotcha. As that wheel starts to turn, there are some gears inside that back box that are going to turn as well. Interesting. Once you've turned that wheel a hundred times, that final gear is going to rotate back up to the top. It's got an extra long spoke on it. It's mm. going to wrap the back of the box. Pop! To let you know that it is done. So. Goes the weasel. <laughs> Pop goes the weasel. Interesting. Now from there, you can either go ahead and start weaving if you're doing a plain cloth, mm -hmm. but most people would choose to dye their threads. Now I've got a couple of dyes over here. This first one, this nice deep dark brown, mm. is made of crushed up walnut shells. Wow. Now all these dyes pretty much work the same way. You grind them into a fine powder. You, so you put that powder in very hot water, you soak whatever you're trying to dye in that water. Mm. The longer you let it soak, the darker or more vibrant that color is going to become. Mm. With the blue here, now this is indigo. Indigo is a plant that we grow up in the Carolinas. It's really popular around Charleston. Mm -hmm. We still use indigo today. It's what we dye denim with. Oh, so blue jeans are indigo colored. They sure are. Mm. Now this one right here is another one we still use today. This is carmine. Carmine is used in a lot of beauty products. It's used in lipstick, blush, that little red stripe in your toothpaste. Oh. Uh, it's also used in fruit punches and Twizzlers. Oh. <laughs> it is made of these. These are bugs. They're called cochineal beetles. They're a type of scale bug that lives on cactus out in the American Southwest, oh. Central and South America. They don't really do anything interesting. Uh, they don't bite, they don't fly, they kind of just hang out on the cactus and wait to get plucked. <laughs> <Just there. laughs> uh, we have a few more here in the back. This top one here is marigold, just like the flower. Ooh. Down here we have some chamomile, just like the tea, makes a nice khaki color. And then this is just more crushed walnut. Gotcha. Now these two here are uh, mordant and alum. Uh, basically think of them as salt. So anytime you dye something, you want to rinse it in salt water so that it doesn't ruin the rest of your laundry the next time you take it off for a wash. Wow. Um, that's kind of still a thing today. If you ever get into tie dyeing or if you use RIT dye to dye your jeans darker, you're going to want to rinse that in some warm salt water to set that color in. Interesting. Now these here, uh, one of them is an alum, the other is a sulfur and potassium based salt but regular table salt works just fine. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Interesting. Now from there, you're going to want to turn your beautiful thread into some fabric so you can actually do something with it. Right. This is a sample of homespun cloth. Just means it was, well, spun at home. <laughs> this was made on the loom uh, behind you over here in the corner. Wow. Now that loom is not set up today, but I do have a smaller one here I can demonstrate on if you'd like. So most looms pretty much work the same way. From the front to the back, you've got these long white threads. Those are called your warp. On that loom back there, the warp would be about 25 feet long. Wow. From left to right, you are weaving or creating a weft. Uh, this is a 16 strand loom. That one back there is a 400 strand loom. So to get it operational, I'm gonna need 400 pieces of 25 foot long thread. <laughs> 
which is why it hasn't been finished. <laughs> uh, so to do my weaving, I'm just gonna take my shuttle, which holds my yarn, and go over and under, picking up every other piece of the warp thread until I get all the way across. Now, if I were working on that larger loom back there, it does have two petals down at the bottom. Those petals would pick up every other thread for me in the warp, so I wouldn't have to weave up and down. I could just push one, take my shuttle, throw it across, push the other, throw it back. Wow. Uh, so with that, I could weave about, in eight hours, I could make about one yard of fabric. Wow. Now, I don't eight know. Eight hours, one yard. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I don't know if you do any uh, sewing or crafting, but if you do, you know that one yard is not enough for anything. No. <laughs> For example, I need eight yards to make a dress like this. Wow. Uh, so that's one of the reasons fabric was so expensive and why a lot of people only had two or three outfits to rotate through. Yeah, because <laughs> back in, yeah, everything was so time consuming. It really was. Uh, so that's sort of the prequel of the textile market. Um, none of that would have been in a traditional dressmaker's shop. Okay. If you were to walk in from about here over is what you would see. Oh, okay. So your typical customer would walk in, they would pick out a bolt of fabric, and then they'd go home and make their own clothes. You could either do that by copying something you already had, say you had a shirt, you loved the way it fit, but it was getting a little rough around the edges, getting a little worn out. You could take apart those seams, mm -hmm. copy it onto your new fabric, and then put both back together if you've got two shirts. Now this right here is a pattern. This is a reproduction from 1858 to 1862. They did have patterns during the time period. And if you happen to be someone who can read a modern sewing pattern, mm -hmm. you can read these as well. Wow. The technology really hasn't changed. So like this piece right here, all these different lines you're seeing are just these size markers. Now, if I were making this for myself, I would cut it to my size. Since I'm more of a commercial seamstress, I make dresses for five different women. I need all of my sizes, so right. I do leave them intact. Uh, right here, you also have the grain line. Now that actually goes back to the loom. So you've got the long strings are your warp, and then from left to right, you've got your weft. So you've got long string and short string. They're going to stretch differently. So if I make half of my top this way, and then I make half of my top this way, when I wash it, it's going to do some very strange things when it dries. <laughs> uh, so the grain line is actually very important. I gotcha, yeah. Now with a dress like this, it's gonna take me about two weeks to completely hand sew it from start to finish. We did have sewing machines during the time period. I've got two down here on the end. They date to about 1870 and about 1890. Now I don't use them for a couple of reasons. Number one, they're from 1870 they don't work. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good reason. <laughs> uh, number two, even when they were brand new, they did not work super well. Gotcha. Uh, you may have seen a foot pedal or treadle design like this before. Mm -hmm. My grandmother had one. Yeah. So they were common on sewing machines up through the 1920s and 30s. So we're talking 60 years before that. This is almost like the prototype. Right. Um, they would break between three and five times a day. Wow. Uh, now for me personally, I think that's super annoying. And so I don't like to fool with it. <laughs> uh, it can sew faster than me when it works. Right. Um, another reason you won't see them super commonly is because of their expense. These machines, or a comparable one, would have cost about $200 in 1865. Man, that's a lot of money. For reference, a well-established seamstress like myself, who has her own shop, yeah. would make about 85 cents a day. Um, now, a better paying trade, like say a master carpenter here mm. in Georgia, would make $3 a day in 1865. Wow. Uh, so, normal people couldn't afford yeah. this. If you have one, you're either in the industry, you work in a factory, or you are so wealthy that it's pretty much just a toy for you. Right. Because at that point, you can pay someone else to make your clothes for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and that was another thing that was fairly common. So if you were a wealthier customer, you could, of course, just pay us to do all that work for you. These are samples of what's known as a fashion plate. They're from Godey's Ladies Book, which is sort of the uh, vogue of the 1850s. Well. Uh, I call it that for one of two reasons. Number one, it's full of beautiful clothes. Number two, none of the models are drawn to scale. Um, 
as you can see in here, these are illustrations and uh, the proportions are not true to life, shall we say. Just like a fashion or runway sketch today. Interesting. Um, so with these here, um, someone could bring in their favorite issue of the magazine, say last September's, open it up to page 12. They would give me their measurements or I could take them from them and say, hey, I want this dress in red. Thank we would have a turnaround of about five or six days for that, and then they would come and pick it up. Wow. Now, another really useful tool for a dressmaker is a porcelain doll. This is my tiny mannequin. Wow. This dress takes me eight yards of fabric and two weeks to make. This dress takes me one yard of fabric and two days to make. So if I have a customer who either can't read a pattern, or if she's a little indecisive and she doesn't know exactly what she wants, this is my new best friend. Wow. Uh, you know, I can make this, and if she says, you know, hey, actually, I kind of hate that trim. Well, no big deal. Or, you know, I think I wanted four ruffles instead of three. Okay, fine. We're talking like three inches of fabric here. Yeah. If she had waited until I made the entire dress, she and I would be having a very different conversation. That makes me cringe 200 years later. <laughs> <laughs> so dolls were super useful. Wow. So that is the basic rundown of my shop. Uh, do you have any questions or see anything odd you'd like to talk about? <laughs> no. Um, actually, I would like to, being a hat person, I see you got some hats there. And uh, I'm a specifically a fedora person. Okay. Do you know anything about... My batteries died, so I was like uh, asking her about hats. And some, actually, she's got some very interesting information about... Uh, 1850s fashion and uh, a society that came along. Okay, so the hats are actually a new addition to the Adams Clothing Shop here. Uh, so I am still expanding on the information that we found. However, I did discover uh, that 1830s hats, and in particular 1830s women's fashion, uh, resulted in the creation of the Audubon Society, which of course protects a lot of our native songbirds. Uh, it's a bit of a strange correlation, uh, but basically what happened was women's hats were really big and they had a whole bunch of things on them. People would add feathers, glass beads, all sorts of jewelry, and then they got kind of competitive and it became a question of who could have the biggest hat, who could do the most with it. And eventually you ended up with women who had fully taxidermied birds on their hat. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen Harry Potter, but uh, if you think of Augusta Longbottom, Neville's grandmother, and her entire vulture that she wore on her hat, that actually wasn't too far off. Now, these would have been smaller birds. We're talking, uh, you know, little songbirds this right. big, not an entire vulture. Right. <laughs> but the premise is real. Right. Um, so there was almost an extinction of several of the Native American songbirds. And so the ladies' hat industry is directly responsible for the creation of the Audubon <laughs> Society. <laughs> wow. I'm a fedora guy myself. <laughs> <laughs> and there's no dead birds on my hat. Uh, for, yeah. Oh, but they're vintage. You could bring it back. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, <laughs> well, I really appreciate your, uh, your, your tour here. This is very nice. What is your name? Okay. Uh, my name is Olivia, and thank you guys so much for stopping in. I really love to have visitors. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are, we are very happy to have stopped in, Absolutely. and this was very nice. Thank I you. I caught the tail end of it, but I got the gist of it, <laughs> and actually learned something today. Hey, always a good day. David yep. was out flying his drone. <laughs> so you do you do the the mending for the the, the I, I want to say the you. characters that work, and you're not characters, the actors, I guess. The, yeah, the, um, we do do a third person interpretation. Uh, you know, I'm. 21st century Olivia. I'm not, you know, Lizzie McBee from 1842. But we do wear the clothing. <laughs> sure. And uh, that well, also it helps, comes... it helps people like us get into the ambiance of it because yeah. you, you actually see, and, you know, and especially young children, they don't know that you, you don't live in that time. I mean, oh, it's, it's an imaginary <laughs> world for them. So. <laughs> we get that all the time. Yeah. I have people go, Where do you sleep? It's like, Sweet. Yeah. I go home. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yes, uh, I do do a lot of the repairs for our costume, and that is the correct word for it in here. Yeah. Okay. Um, especially okay. with our male interpreters, uh, they seem to really enjoy giving me uh, a button, just handing it back to me and saying, hey, can you put this back on? I don't know where it was. <laughs> I found it. So yeah. And it um, matches these, so it must go here somewhere. 
Yeah, they're pretty bad about uh, ripping their suspenders when they go to chop wood. Um, I'm not exactly sure what happens there. <laughs> well, and if you think about it, that happened back in those times too. The wife had to repair, do all the mending of the socks and the everything else, I'm sure. So. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, it is a very fun insight. I am a lot more appreciative of my modern clothing now that I know all of the work that went into it. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, currently, I am working on a piece for Jess. She's our Native American interpreter in Wells. I don't know okay. if you've met her yet. I don't think so. I haven't um, been over there yet. But yeah, so most of our clothing is made here on site. Okay. Uh, now, with her, she did purchase one of her skirts, and uh, it's like four inches too long. So I'm hemming that for her today. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. Catch the smoke coming out of the chimney. Oh. Hello. How you doing? Doing wonderful. Welcome to the McDonald House. Y'all doing all right today? Doing good. Yeah, how about yourself? Do you mind being on camera? Yeah, you're good. Oh, okay. Awesome.